The last few weeks we've been taking a look at the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. And this week we're going to be taking a look at a different aspect, peace. And we're going to be in Philippians, the fourth chapter. <clears throat> now, sometimes it's um, hard to know what the fruit of the Spirit is, that singular thing, and we take a look at different aspects of it. It's kind of like the three blind men who were looking at the elephant, and they were trying to decide what an elephant looked like, and so they were trying to describe it. So the first one grabbed hold of the elephant's leg and said, oh, it's like a massive tree. And then the second blind man grabbed hold of the trunk and go, no, it's more like a, a, a fire hose. And then the third one grabbed hold of the elephant's tail and said, no, it's more like twine or a rope. They each had an aspect of the elephant, but they weren't grabbing the whole picture. And in Galatians there, talking about the fruit of the Spirit, they want to make sure that we know all the different aspects of the fruit of the Spirit so that we can enjoy that and have those qualities in our lives. So there was a little boy named Bobby, and Bobby, like some uh, boys, had a very active imagination. And on one day, he was coming home from school, and a large black dog ran out in front of him and across the street, and he ran all the way home and busted into the kitchen and said, Mom, you're never going to believe what happened to me today. And she goes, well, why don't you tell me? He goes, well, I was coming home from school, and a big black bear jumped out and tried to eat me, but I was too fast, and I ran all the way home. And his mom said, that's a great story. I think your dad would love to hear that. So a few hours later, when dad gets home from work, Bobby greets him at the door and says, Dad, you're never going to believe what happened. He says, well, tell me. He goes, well, I was walking home from school and a big black bear jumped out and tried to eat me, but I was too fast and I ran all the way home. So his dad said, well, son, I tell you what. Why don't you go up to your room, get down on your knees, and ask God what He thinks of your story. So, Bobby trotted upstairs, and just a few moments later, he comes down, bounding down the stairs, and he says, well, son, what did God think of your story? And Bobby said, well, Dad, when I was telling God, he said the first time he saw that dog, he thought it was a bear too. <laughs> You know, life can be like that. At times, life feels like a bear, that it's bearing down on us, that it's bigger than life itself. Whether it's health problems or addictions or family issues or a life filled with stress, sometimes life can just feel overwhelming to us. But we all want to experience peace in our lives. Whether you're a national leader sitting across the table with other national leaders and country leaders, you want peace. Or if you're a businessman trying to meet deadlines and stresses of the job, you want to experience peace. Even a homemaker just trying to corral children, you want peace. Or maybe you're a student and you're trying to just meet the demands of the class or just make it through the semester or try to pass the next test. We just want to find peace. And most of us are willing to go to different lengths to find peace in our lives. And if we have to admit it, we experience more stress than we do peace. Even though we search for peace and I haven't met very many people that go out and say, Today, I'm going to go trying to find me some stress. I don't think I have enough. We as Americans live in comfortable homes, but domestic violence is at an all-time high. Our cities are some of the most modern in the world, and yet at times our streets are unsafe. Our communication technology is unsurpassed. 
but there has been never, there's never been more misunderstanding in our lives. In fact, I would say that there are some people here this morning that are filled with stress and anxiety that my sermon's not even going to be able to put you to sleep. That, that was a joke. It may, anyway. <laughs> Is it possible to have peace in the world in which we live? Paul gives us clear directions on how we can have peace in our lives. And he wants us to see that and to experience that ourselves. So let's look in Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4. Would you please stand as we read from God's word? Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Now, if you just see these words from Paul... You might think that maybe he's in a luxury hotel or in a grand house or maybe in a palace talking about being positive and experiencing God's peace, that maybe he's living life on easy street. But much to the opposite of that, Paul's in a Roman dungeon awaiting his court date. This dungeon is, probably has water running down the wall. The stench is probably unbearable, rodents running around, bugs everywhere. And yet he is waiting for his court date, and the verdict of that court date could be his execution. And yet Paul finds peace in his own life despite the circumstances around us. And Paul's writing to the church in Philippi, and he's who were going great persecution of all kinds. It was a handful of people that were defending a new faith against a hostile ruling class. So Paul from prison writes a letter to encourage them. And it may look like to the world that Paul has lost everything. It may look like the wheels of life have fallen off for Paul being in a dungeon. But Paul had peace. He had true peace, a kind of peace that can rejoice even in a Roman jail cell that awaits the possibility of execution. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but if I was in that situation, I wouldn't be writing to tell other people, hey, by the way, I'm in jail, but hey, here's how you can have peace. I'd be saying, hey, can you get me out of here? This place is awful. I have to cuddle up with rats at night to, for a pillow. The stench here is unbearable. I don't have any freedom. My bed is a stone wall. I would be complaining. I would be seen negative. And I think a lot of us have that same tendency in life as when things are going bad, we don't focus and look on good things or look for God's peace. We focus in on the negative things that are happening. It's kind of like the lady who bought her husband a necktie. Actually, she bought him two. And he was so appreciative, he went in and put on the tie and came out. And she looked and said, you didn't like the other one? Sometimes we as humans just tend to focus in on the things that are negative. But you may be thinking, well, Paul's just one of those people that just looks at life through rose-colored glasses, and it doesn't matter what's happening, 
in his life, he just sees a rosy picture that life is always good for him. It reminds me of a story of an old lady who was brought to a care facility and as she was sitting there, a group of men came up to her and the first man said, well, are, are you new here? And she goes, well, well, yes, I am. And the second one said, well, where did you come from? He goes, well, for the last 25 years, I've been in prison. And the third one said, oh, well, prison, what, what were you in for? And she said, well, I was uh, in jail for killing my husband. And the fourth one said, well, man, that's great. That means you're single, doesn't it? <laughs> that's not the kind of view that Paul had in life. That's not where he had peace in his life. And he wanted other people to be able to experience the peace that comes from a relationship with God. Paul wants us to live with that kind of peace that he discovered in that relationship. And he wants us to be able to discover that too. Now it's not a peace like the world gives. It's not dependent on the circumstances around us. It's not here today and gone tomorrow. It's a peace that rises above all understanding and it exceeds our understanding. It goes beyond our comprehension. God's peace is more than positive thinking. It's more than just warm, fuzzy feelings. We can experience God's peace in the midst of whatever conflict that we're experiencing. And I think here in the verses that we looked at, Paul gives us some practical steps on our journey to experience the kind of peace that God offers. The first thing that Paul says is that we need to rejoice in the Lord. Matter of fact, he was so emphatic about that, he said, hey, I'm going to tell you again, rejoice in the Lord. Now that seems strange from a man that's in a jail cell waiting for his court date that's going to lead to his execution. If we want to have peace, we must realize that it doesn't come from our circumstances. It doesn't come from the people who are around you. It doesn't come from this world and things that it offers. We must realize that our inward attitudes don't have to reflect our outward circumstances. Let me say that again. We must realize that our inward attitudes don't have to reflect our outward circumstances. No matter what's going on in our lives, we must always remind ourselves that God is near to us. And that's why Paul says that he can rejoice in the prison. That's the reason you and I can rejoice in the midst of our circumstances is because God is near to us and we can rejoice because of that. The second thing that Paul wants us to see is that we need to be reasonable with others. Different scriptures translate that word differently. Some say gentleness or gentle and kind or fair-minded or charitable. And if you notice there, Paul doesn't say, just don't be kind and gentle to other believers. No, he says, let it be evident to all people. Now, that's not always easy when people have wronged us, people have hurt our feelings, people have rejected us or not included us. It's not always easy to be reasonable. Our natural tendency is to lash out at to people and to be mean back to them. To be reasonable with others is just not getting along with others, but it is also not saying that, hey, I have to have my way, or about being vocal about the rights that have been trampled on. It's not about seeking revenge against those who have wronged us and treated us unfairly. Even when we're hurt and wounded, you don't have to get worked up and be demanding on others. Instead, let your reasonableness be known 
to everyone. Be gentle rather than vindictive. And how can we act that way? Because we have first experienced God's love, His grace, and His forgiveness in our own lives. And because we have experienced that, then we can extend that to other people. Does that mean it's easy for us? No. But the more that we do that, the more that we can experience the kind of peace that God has to offer for us. So we need to rejoice in the Lord. We need to be reasonable with others. And then we need to replace worry with prayer. We have to turn our worries into prayer. George Gosselin, back in the early 1900s, was a YMCA director uh, outside of Pittsburgh. And it was not a good year and a good time for the YMCA there that George was taking care of. They were losing money. They were losing members. They were losing workers. George was working 85 plus hours just to try to keep the building open. And this went on for a long time. And George felt he couldn't take that much longer, so he went to see a counselor. And the counselor said, George, you're on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Somehow, you have got to figure out how to let that go. So George decided that he would take his Bible and his journal and go to, for a walk in the woods near where he lived. And as he was entering the woods and he felt the coolness under the leaves, he heard, heard the chirping of the birds, he decided he would just sit down and experience God's creation. And as he began to do that and to look and read from the Psalms, he felt the tension in his neck and shoulders begin to melt away. And he started journaling things. And one of the things he journaled is he said, Dear God, as of today, I resign as the general manager of the universe. Love, George. <clears throat> Years later, while he was reflecting on that with a group of people, he said, Wonders of wonders, God accepted my resignation. You know, the same can be true for you and me. How often do you and I think that we have to control all the world around us and we have to be able to fix this circumstance? God never asked us to do that. No matter what we're experiencing and going through, we don't have to be the general manager of the universe. We don't have to be the general manager of our lives. That's what God wants to do for us. And when we turn that over to Him, we can begin to experience His peace in our lives. So if we want to experience peace and to worry less, we need to pray more and worry less. Worry just comes natural to us. And we worry about all kinds of things, but we need to stop and pray and allow God's peace to wash over us. Some of you are parents, some of you are grandparents. And so you know when a child or a grandchild comes to you and asks something of you, your response is sometimes dependent on how they approach you, isn't it? If they come up and say, well, all my friends have this, you have to do this for me. Well, I don't know if you're like me, I, maybe I'm just a bad dad. I always say, no, you're not getting that. But if a child comes to you with a humble heart, with a brokenness before you, with a gentle spirit, and lets their requests be made known to you, a lot of times we'll move heaven and earth to help that happen for that child. How much more so will God do that for us when we humble ourselves before Him in prayer? When we come before Him, laying the things that are heavy on our hearts and in our lives, and we lay them at our feet, how much more will He want to give us His peace, not the peace that the world gives? Not something that's here today and gone tomorrow, but His peace in our hearts and in our lives. So we need to pray with thanksgiving and with a grateful and appreciation in our hearts 
as we approach God. Rejoice in the Lord. Be reasonable with others. Replace worry with prayer. And the fourth thing that Paul encourages us to do is rearrange life and thought. Paul understood that culture was a great influencer in people's lives. And it may be even so for us today. We are surrounded with technology. We have access to more information about what's going on around the world than we ever have. For a lot of us, the first thing that we do in the morning is we pick up our phone, we see what the headlines are in the world as we've been asleep. Or we see what people have posted on Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat. We see what a great life that they're living. Let me share an insight with you about some of that. When we look at other people's lives on social media, we see what's going on on the outside of their world. We may see that they're in a great place or they're with a a great group of people or we may see that they're experiencing something great on the outside. But there's not a way to capture what's on the inside of their lives. Even though they're experiencing a great place or great people, they could still be lonely and hurting on the inside. There's not a way to take a picture of that and put that up there. And so we don't need to compare outside things to inside things. And that's what God is concerned about, what's going on on the inside of our lives, the things that are weighing us down, the things that concern us. He wants us to come before Him, lay those things down, and we need to be careful about what we put in our thoughts. Paul gives us a list of things that he says that we need to be thinking about. And are those the kinds of things that we're putting into our minds and into our hearts? Or the things that we put into our minds and the things that we dwell on truthful or dependable, worthy of respect? Are they just? Are they holy? Are they lovable? And are they praiseworthy? Do you know that on average, every person in America complains 20 times in one day? How many of y'all think that that's a high number? Yeah, I thought that was kind of low. So evidently some of y'all are not complaining as much as I am. So I appreciate you bringing the average down for me. But we as America tend to complain about what's going on in life. What's going on around us on the outside. God wants us to focus in on what's going on on the inside and what he's doing in our lives. And to help us to do that, we need to see if the things that we're thinking on and praying about and that are concerned, are they lovely? Do, are they things that lead to peace? Are they just? And the great filter here for me is, are they holy? The things that I'm putting into my mind, into my eyes, the things that I'm thinking about, are they just and holy and lovable? Are you and I centering our minds on the things that are wholesome? Are we implanting in our heart things that are honorable and that bring about peace. King Solomon, one of the wisest men that ever lived, wrote in Proverbs 23, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What are we dwelling on? What are we thinking on? So as we put those things into our heart, that usually that's what comes out in our words, that comes what's out in our actions. And Paul says, the things that you've heard from me and seen in me, do those things, put them into practice. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of us this morning would say, hey, following me around for 24 or 48 hours, 
And then whatever I do, you do that and you'll be just fine. I'm not sure I could raise my hand to that. But Paul says, you lived with me. You saw my actions and my words. Put those things into action. Do those things. Practice them. Practice them over and over again. You, your life and my life needs to be an example to other people to give them hope, to give them encouragement. A few days ago, I was in a store and it was obvious that the cashier was not having a great day at all. She was grumpy. She was rude. She didn't look at people in the face. And she was just, everybody was just a number and hurry up so the line will get shorter kind of a person. I don't know what kind of day she had been or what she had been experiencing in her life. And when I got up there, sure enough, she didn't look at me. She didn't smile. She was rude. She just told me how much I owed her. And so as we made the transaction, I said, you know, I hope your day is better than what it's been so far today. Have a good day. And as I turned to walk off, she said, thank you, you're the first person who has said a kind word to me all day. How many people do we encounter each and every day in our circles of life that feel that same way, that don't have that hope that you and I have, the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, and because of that hope, we can experience the fruit of the Spirit of peace in our hearts. You may be here this morning and thinking, you know, I've never experienced that kind of hope or that kind of peace. I don't really know what it's like to walk with God, to experience His forgiveness in my life. We want to be able to help you experience that and start that journey this morning. And if you'd like somebody to pray with you about that, we'll be down here at the front in just a moment. Or maybe this morning God is saying all those things that you are carrying around that you're fretting over and worrying about and wringing your hands about. I just want you to lay those things down so I can allow you to experience peace this morning. Stop carrying around all that weight and let me carry it for you. God wants you to experience peace. Just as Paul did in the dungeon. Just as the Philippians experienced it in the midst of persecution. He wants you to experience that peace in your life. Not because of the things that are going on around you. Because of what God's doing in your heart.